Well, good evening. Do you want to like Oregon tonight, Can you hear me without me shouting? Say again. Maybe while I wasn't talking, I stopped. That was the part you couldn't hear me. Uh, all right. Okay, well, two things. First of all, uh, we're having a Super Bowl party Sunday, and so we're going to use these couches. And so I thought it would just be a good experiment to set them up tonight and see if anybody sits in the front row. Because the front row is really just a buffer. So, guys, thank you. Nice job. The best seats in the house, right up here. But before, and so this is, if you, if you haven't been here before, like we don't normally do couches in the front, but we could. I don't know we could reward the people who want to get really, really close. But uh, tonight, before we get to the word, um, as Karen mentioned, we've got a few things figured out about our spring break trip, and we'd love for you to join us. And so I've asked Ethan Dixon to come and share a little bit with you guys uh, about his experience with our spring break and why he thinks you all should go to Florida with us. Thomas, sit right here. Uh, Nope. Hang on. Okay. Hello. Okay. Hi. Um, as Jason said, um, you know, I'm Ethan Dixon. Uh, I went last year on spring break. We went to Indianapolis last year. Woo! Spring break! Spring break. Woo! Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, a lot of memories. Um, a lot of friendships built off of it. Uh, people that I didn't really know, like Jonathan. Uh, I don't know if Lincoln's here. Uh, but he and I sat on the bus, and I had never met him before, and by the end of that trip, we were pretty close, so. Um, it was a really good time, um, and Jason wanted me to share some reasons, uh, just like my experience last year on the spring break trip, um, what I got out of it, and then why you should also go. Um, so last year, just a little bit of background, I guess, if you don't know, we went to Indianapolis, and we were in the south side neighborhood of Indianapolis, which was very um, impoverished, I guess. It's just a lower income neighborhood of Indianapolis. And so we uh, partnered with a church there, I can't remember the church, but Jed Fuller was the guy that we kind of worked with, and he's there trying to um, establish a ministry of just like helping kind of rebuild, um, not rebuild, but just kind of like maybe, uh, well yeah, build a ministry center there for more outreach for people that are there um, that don't know Christ. Um, and so we helped, uh, a couple people went to the church that he was part of and helped with their um, food bank, and they had a clothes thrift store thing, I don't know what, the, what it was exactly. But they helped with that. Some people went and helped tear down a, uh, I don't know, a garage, um, and they were going to, uh, a couple of the guys, or they were going to build something on that. A new home. Of, like, what? They were going to build a new home there. A new home, that's right, yeah. They were going to build a new house there eventually. So our, some of our guys helped uh, demolish the garage there. And some of us also helped build, uh, they had a vacant lot, so we helped, um, kind of cleaned it up and ended up turning it into a park, a small little pocket park uh, over the course of a uh, week. Um, so that was just, that was really cool. I was on the park team and we, you know, it was a lot of work. Obviously it was cold out there. Um, one of the perks of going to Florida, I guess it'd be warm weather. That'd be nice. Long snow on us, hopefully. Um, but yeah, just, it was incredible, I guess, just to see. Um, so we also, we went with KU, Campus Christian Day. That. So we got to also, um, I guess, meet a lot of the people from there, and for those of you who know Matt and Lexi, we got to, I guess, meet them finally, hearing about them a lot. Um, they were really nice people, and it was cool just to kind of see two campus ministries come together um, in a place that, you know, I know some of us have never been to. On our spring break, um, we could have been at home, you know, watching Netflix or working or whatever, sitting around, which I would have been doing, but um, luckily I went to Indianapolis and had a blast. Um, but it was really cool seeing that happen and just seeing God at work um, in a lot of different ways um, and hearing about like, people that went to the church and helped with like the, um, the ministry there and hearing their stories about like, talking with people that they were helping um, and how they were impacted by, um, by, that, by that work being done. So um, I guess just like the main thing that I want to say is um, like last year before spring break, I was really hesitant to go at first because I was still, I was a freshman last year and I was still trying to get involved with the issue, but I was trying to figure out, you know, I was still kind of uh, shy and trying to break out of my shell a little bit. And uh, I don't know, I, I think Jason talked to me before spring break and just kind of convinced me to, to go for it, you know, and 
So I thought, well, you know, why not um, try it out and, you know, do something over spring break and not sit at home. Uh, ended up being a really great decision. So if you're hesitant about it, if you're, um, you know, you're, if it seems like a big, like, because I know we're doing disaster relief, I think, in Florida this year. Um, and if that seems like, you know, something scary or daunting, something you're not comfortable with, um, just, sometimes you have to be a little uncomfortable, especially when you're a Christian, you know, and um, this is a chance to, to go out and, um, you know, to serve um, other people uh, in a whole, like, completely different place. For some people, it, like, I may never get the chance to go overseas and uh, preach the gospel, um, but I can at least, you know, go help people in Florida and, you know, serve that way. Um, so, yeah, if you have a heart to serve and you have nothing going on over spring break and you want to make some good memories and meet some good people in the BSU, um, you should definitely consider going to spring break in Florida. that I really love about these kind of trips is uh, because we'll be doing disaster relief and you don't have to have skill for that. Uh, we're going to be coming in. Uh, there was uh, Hurricane Michael happened back in October and there was a ton of devastation and there were just a lot of believers who showed up. In fact, this church was that we're going to be partnering with, First Baptist Church of Bristol, was not affected. They were one, I mean, they were one of the few. And so they became a host. And so there were actually disaster relief teams from Missouri who went and stayed at their church and worked there. And there are times, I mean, if, if uh, you know, if somebody remembers your birthday, and you know, that's cool. I mean, they give you a car, they give you a little bit of money, that's cool. But you could get by without that. I mean, if everybody, if you can mom for God, that'd be a bummer. But, you know, for the most part, it's not like a need, that's just kind of a nice thing. But when life falls apart, and it's just a disaster everywhere you turn, and some people show up and, and offer you no strings attached help, that is a rarity. And it's almost always done in the name of Jesus. Uh, and that's us. I mean, that we, we can go and love because Jesus has loved us. And so I'm, one of the things I love about a trip like this, guys, is that you can do this. We're going to go to Florida and do it, but you can do this here. I mean, you know, when we get all this snow and ice, I promise you there are people in this community who don't have the means to get the snow and ice off of their property. And so, uh, in fact, we have a neighbor who uh, we do our best to help her out and take care of her. And one day uh, there was uh, a very enterprising young man who owned some property in the area. And he told her, he's like, hey, I'll, I can mow your yard for you and I can get it really done, done really fast. She's a widow. He's like, I'll come to your, your yard for you. He's like, that's great. He's like, it'll just cost you a hundred bucks. And I was like, she's like, no oh, thanks. So, now, there's plenty of people who will help if they're going to get something out of it, is what I'm saying. But we can help with those strings attached. And this is a great opportunity to go. And if you've never been to Florida, we're going to go to Camp Hill. You can look up Bristol, where it is. Uh, the plan, of course, you know, like plans, you, you, you kind of hold those tentatively. But the plan, I was talking to Pastor Matt today, that uh, we're going to spend some time on St. George Island, which has got some of the most beautiful beaches in the world. And I understand it's not going to be 100 degrees, but I looked, and just next week, we tread inside. We're going to go at the end of March, but next Wednesday, when it's projected to be a high of 16 in Maryville, I'm sorry, it's going to get warm, it's going to get cold again, but next Wednesday it's a high of 16, and in Bristol it's a high of 78. So I imagine when we go at the end of March, I, it doesn't matter how warm it is, Karen, it's going to feel great, and I know some people are going to get in the ocean, so, you know, so that's fine. All right, so so that was your advertisement for spring break. And again, like Karen said, if, if, if the thing that would keep you from going is money, as far as we're concerned, I mean, I know in life that's a good reason to not do some things you can't afford it. But for, for going and serving on spring break, that's a terrible reason. All right, because if that's the only thing that would keep you from going, we will figure out a way for you to be able to go. So talk to us about that. And so some of you guys, I even you already decided you're going. So I would, I would love for you to sign up tonight. All right, so if you know you're going, can you go ahead and sign up? Because there's some people in this room that if they knew that you were going, they would probably go too, okay? All right, so there you go. So that's the spring break plug. So, uh, so tonight, before, as we kind of get into the Word, we've, we've got 
a uh, big cultural experience Sunday, and I understand that not everybody is a football fan, right? It's okay. And some of us, like, I, I'm actually not um, too hurt as a Chiefs fan. Like, I have experienced this my whole life. So, uh, you know, hey, it's, it's okay. Uh, I've been there, done that. I still had a lot of fun this year as a fan. Uh, but, but nonetheless, even if you're not a fan of football, okay, even if you don't love football, there's a lot of preparation that goes into the games, and it's not just the two teams that are going to play. All right, I was just thinking about, like, there's so many people who are preparing. There's so many people who are getting ready for this. And let's just set the teams aside. There's a lot of security that's involved in this event. There's a lot of entertainment that's involved in this event. You know, I don't know who's, who's, do you guys, do we know? You know, Travis Scott. And Travis Scott. Okay, all right. Try this at the halftime show, but it's probably not just going to be the, the handful of people that are probably going to be like backup dancers, and there's going to be people that they bring down so they got some crowd in front of them, and they all have to get ready. They're all preparing for the game. Probably for some of you, your favorite thing about the Super Bowl is the party. All right. Which, it just seems like there's a consensus that last year the commercials were a real letdown. Millions of dollars, right? And they spend a lot of time, and some of the commercials you're watching them, you're like, I have no, no one spent time on this. No one's playing, this is terrible. But somebody thought this was good. Somebody put a lot of time and effort into planning this was the thing. In fact, there used to be a time, I don't think this is there anymore, but when you would drive up I 29 from Kansas City, you would be around that, like, that Tracy Weston exit, and there was a billboard. From Missouri Western. <laughs> and does anybody know there was a there was a person on there? Do you know where I'm going with this? Do you know what it said? She produced a Super Bowl commercial. That's right. I'm Missouri Western. I know. It's like miracles, right? This way. <laughs> uh, but no, uh, Missouri Western. She produced a Super Bowl commercial. Like, that's a big deal. And there's a lot of effort that goes into that. And so even Sunday. We're going to come together here, we're going to have more seating than this, and we're going to have um, our first ever BSU wing competition, alright? So we're going to come and have wings and, and, and snacks and whatever, and we're going to watch the game, we're going to have some prizes to give away, and so even for us, like, we're putting effort, we're planning, we're thinking about this, okay? And that's just a, so, and, and, and that's just a couple things, I'm sure we thought about it, I mean, like, traffic is probably a big deal. And figuring out a plan for that. And how are you going to get everybody into the game on time? Get everybody out of the game on time. There's just so much stuff. And it's just a... Can I say it's just a silly football game? Mm. Mm. I mean, my, our team's not in it, so... Right? Like, life will go on. It's not really that important. And I just think, man, something that's really not that significant in life gets that much preparation, that much attention, that much of our focus of our lives. It's that important to people. And yet, guys, um, when it comes to, and, and really even for us, and I know this doesn't matter to a lot of people, but as believers, when it comes to our spiritual health, our spiritual well-being, um, really having a plan for how we're going to win the battle for, uh, for pure, the, how, the way we're going to win the battle for righteousness, the way we're going to win the battle against temptation, we don't spend that much time. And yet the consequences are so much greater. It has such a much bigger impact on our lives than whether you love or hate the Patriots or you, you love or hate the Rams because they abandoned you in Missouri or whatever you feel about these two teams. Like, it doesn't really matter. You'll still have, well, you may not. You probably, like, you'll, maybe you'll have class Monday. You'll have class sometime, right? In April, we'll have all the classes. But life goes on. And yet things that, that really matter, guys, and so I want to I come back to this at the end. So I just want to say this now, that um, that's some of the biggest mistakes that people make in their lives. All right, now I've, I'm not, I, you know, I don't pastor a church. I've heard this story from a pastor. He said, you know, I've counseled countless people who sat in my office, and, and they're lamenting, they're grieving a, a horrible moral failure in their lives. And they would say, he says, without fail, they all say this. They say, you know what, Pastor? 
I would do anything. I would give anything if I could go back and undo what happened. And what he said after that is always stuck with me. He says, okay, so, so we would give anything, we would do anything to undo it. He says, but why is it that we aren't willing to do whatever it takes to keep it from happening in the first place? And so tonight, it's last week we talked about temptation and dealing with some of that. We're going to continue on to this, on this theme tonight about this battle, uh, the spiritual battle, uh, and, and, and understanding that we have these God-given spiritual weapons for the spiritual war, that it's real. And it's much more meaningful than the battle on the gridiron that everybody's going to be really interested in or pay, pay a lot of attention to for a few hours next Sunday. And so, um, so we're going to launch today out of 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I told you guys last week that we're going to go to one of my favorite passages. It's going to be Proverbs chapter 7, and we're going to camp out there. And, and so tonight I want to look a little bit more... Um, last week, if you, uh, if you were here, you remember, or if you weren't here, last week we really looked at the, the commonality of temptation. Uh, I didn't use this analogy last week, but, but temptation is a little bit like ice cream. That maybe, maybe somebody likes vanilla or chocolate or Rocky Road, but at the end of the day, it's still ice cream. And that there really are, uh, the temptations that you face are actually not radically different than what everybody else faces. And we think that's crazy. But the Word of God says, no temptation sees you except what is common to man. And that God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what, you're, what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will provide a way out. And, and even that in, in Hebrews uh, 4, 14 through 16, it tells us that Jesus, that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who is tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. And therefore, we can go to Him to find help, because He understands and so last week, God, we looked at the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. We looked at the temptation of Jesus and how really the temptations that we face kind of boil down into sort of these three categories. And so I want to have that as a foundation, but we're going to continue um, understanding where this battle really takes place and how do we have victory over that. And so, um, so we're going to be here in 2 Corinthians 10. And let me go ahead and uh, read that and we'll go from there. 2 Corinthians 10, um, 1 through 6. Paul, he says, I, Paul, myself, entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I who am humble and face to face with you, but bold toward you and I am away. I beg of you that when I am present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Now, there is, and again, we've been going through 2 Corinthians for the whole school year. There's a lot of other things that I can talk about here. There's a lot of context, a lot of going on. And remember, this is, uh, again, a part of why Paul is constantly having to defend himself because because it's not really about Paul's reputation, but it's about the message that Paul's preaching. But here we see that some people are saying, you know, Paul, you just do things in a worldly manner. And Paul says, one thing we don't do in a worldly manner is we do not wage war in a worldly manner. It's a spiritual battle with spiritual weapons. And so, uh, first of all, understanding that, um, that there primarily are three enemies that we face. All right? First of all, we face the world. And again, this is really what we focused on last week, that the world, I'm not talking about um, the earth, and I'm not really talking about people. In fact, uh, I think there's this really interesting, like on the surface, we can feel like people all are our enemy. And, and I, I know for a fact, I mean, at one point, Paul says that there are many people who live as enemies of the cross. But for us, I would prefer that if there are people who are against you who maybe don't know Christ, rather than thinking of them as your enemies, think of them as people who are slaves to sin. Scripture says they've been taken captive by the devil. And they're more like prisoners who need to be set free rather than your enemies that you're at war with. Paul writes in Ephesians 6 and he says uh, that our battle is not against flesh and blood. And so even though maybe you don't get along with your roommate or a classmate or a co-worker and you feel like they're your enemy, at the end of the day, they are actually somebody who needs to be liberated by Christ. But your enemy is, is spiritual, and there's a spiritual battle. And so here, the three, the three enemies that we primarily face, the first is the world. And, and 1 John 2, 
15 through 17 is where we parked out last week, and understanding that the world is a system, it's a way of life. And the world is not neutral in this conflict. And so 1 John 2, 15 through 17, right, he says, Do not love the world or anything in the world, for if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. And so there's this system of life. And guys, we just get swept up into it. I mean, if you're not, if you are not swimming against the currents, you will get swept downstream. As the believer, I mean, and if you, you just, that's just how it works. And Romans 12, 1 tells us, uh, sorry, Romans 12, 2, says, don't conform to the pattern of this world. And that's what the world is trying to squeeze us into its mold that, that we're, we're living for self, we're living for sin, you know, we're, we're giving God the, the middle finger, I'm not going to live for you. And that's the way of the world. And, and so we are constantly at battle with this. And if we forget about that, we're naive and foolish and we're ignoring one of the most powerful forces that, that causes us to, to live in a way in opposition to God. The second thing on here, Galatians 5, 6, and 17, an enemy that you face is, the, is your flesh. Like really, probably the number one enemy that you face if you're trying to follow Christ is your sin nature. Is, is when you look in the mirror every day, I know for me, this is the most ba difficult battle that I find, even though sometimes maybe I think of people who are making my life miserable, and I'm like, ah, I don't like these people. Uh, but that's not what the scripture says. They're not the enemy, really, my flesh is the enemy. And so in Galatians 5, 16, 17, it says, uh, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. There's literally a war going on inside every believer between the new you and the old you. And that's enough of a battle to keep you busy for the rest of your life. So you, you have to recognize and understand that. Of course, 1 Peter 5 8 says that the be alert and a sober mind, that your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And there really is a spiritual enemy. And again, then we get, get into Ephesians 6 and look at that. And Paul says our, our battle is against the spiritual powers and authorities, the force of evil in the heavenly realms. Like that's real. And, and so we shouldn't be shocked when there's opposition. We shouldn't be shocked when the world doesn't embrace the ways of Jesus because there's a battle. So, so we kind of establish that. We understand the battle. And um, a little bit there. We can get that out there first. And so the, the weapons that we, that we battle with. Because you gotta, if we're going to win this battle, we have to recognize that we don't take the same strategies that the world does. And how does the world win wars? How does the world win battles? You know, with power, with force, with intimidation, with coercion, with being clever or smarter or sneakier or more deceitful. You know, like, like why whatever means necessary. But that's not how we win a spiritual battle. That's not how we win the battle uh, in our own lives, battling against our flesh. To live righteous lives. That's not how we do that. And so he says we use spiritual weapons. And this is too much. I'm, trust me. Even if you feel like this is going to be a long sermon, it could have been longer. Okay. Like I really try to narrow this down. There's so many things that I would love to just you know make sure you have all these things and that you're living them out. Um, but maybe we live by the power of the Spirit. That's why he says walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of sinful nature. You can't do this apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. You know we live by the power of God's Word. In Ephesians 6, Paul says that the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. And that's what we saw last week in Luke 4. We were reading through the temptation of Jesus every time. It says, it is written. It is written. It is written, man does not live by bread alone. It is written, um, uh, do not put the Lord your God to the test. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. Every time Jesus answered the Scripture, we'll come back to that. But these are our weapons. We live like prayer. He says, take up the sword of the Spirit and pray all the time. Pray in every circumstance. Living in obedience to God. Being in community with one another. These are spiritual weapons. And that's the way that we're going to fight. We're going to talk about that more. And then the last thing on here is starting to recognize where is the battle really happening? Because really, this is a war for your mind. It's a war for how you view things and how you think. That's why Romans 12 says to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Ephesians 4, 4 22 to 24, he says, You are taught with regard to your former way of life, to put, on, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, 
to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness, that we can easily get caught up in like behavior modification. And that's not primarily what we need. Like We need to be transformed here, and then our behavior will start to fall in line. And I don't know, this is silly, but uh, I was, I was uh, headed up to the south side of town like half an hour, an hour ago, I don't know, uh, it's about an hour ago, I'm driving, and I mean, hey, I, got, I, I, I know this is going to shock you, but I'm not perfect, okay? So I'm going to pause, I'm going to take a drink, I'm going to let that soak in. <laughs> and uh, I'm constantly, I feel like, brought face to face, and man, even if I've gotten better, like, I can be a very impatient person. Just can get really annoyed with other people. And, uh, and I was trying to pull out of the BSU parking lot, and uh, of course, you know, it's it's so easy to drive around and pull out of that little spot, and you're sitting on the ice, and cars just kept coming. And I'm like, I'm good to get hit, right? And I'm, I'm pulling out, and I was just like, all these people, right? There's no traffic. It's not like the Truman Show. As soon as you decide you're going to pull out, then all the cars show up. Sorry, it's, it's a pretty entertaining movie. Okay. But, and then so then I drive down Walnut, and I go down to Lincoln, and as I, you know, it's not very wide there, and then there's more cars. Like there, there's like three cars on the road, and they're all right there in front of me. And I, okay, maybe this is, you guys don't get annoyed by that. I don't know, I just am like, all these people. And, and I don't know why, but this thought popped in my head, and, and so I just said this out loud. I was like, you know what? I'm glad that there are other people in this town, and I'm not alone. And I kept driving, and then I kept running into traffic, and I was like, I'm glad so many people live in this town so I can have access to a super Walmart. And <laughs> it's true. And it's like, you know what? I can be mad, or I can just change how I'm thinking about this. And it makes all the difference. So, so God is calling us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So one of the things I want to challenge you guys with tonight is to realize that how you win the battle for temptation is maybe not where you think it is. Okay? And so we're going to jump over to Proverbs chapter 7, which is, like I said, it's a passage I really like a lot. I've, I've shared on this passage multiple times, and um, it's been very instructive to me in analyzing my own life. And though I think there are some predictable patterns to temptation, I definitely think there are, are very predictable results. Uh, I think the details of what this looks like in our lives are different. And so I think it requires discernment for us to evaluate, what does this look like in my life? How do I, how do I assimilate this to walk in obedience to the Lord and even change about the way that I think about temptation, what, I, what it offers to me, how do I get myself into this spot in the first place? Because again, those people... You know, somebody who's maybe, um, you know, uh, just become, uh, you know, uh, completely lost in alcoholism and lost their family, or somebody who's, uh, you know, had an affair and, and also lost their family, or maybe somebody who's gotten into a gambling addiction and has lost everything. You know, people don't wake up and say, you know what, I think today's the day I'm going to ruin my life. It doesn't happen like that. It's one of those where you wake up and you're like, how did this happen? I, I never, I never wanted to be here. I never expected to. I've never. How did it get this bad? And as we look at this passage, I'm going to tell you guys that it's it's a series of small decisions. It's a series of small compromises that lead us to a place that we never wanted to be. We said we would never be, and, and we don't. We know how we got there. We don't, we we hate that it's happened. And so, so let's look at this passage, Proverbs seven. And, and I'll, I'll kind of move quickly through here. There's a lot of other things in this passage we can talk about. But, uh, but in Proverbs 7, I'll say this kind of is a way of introduction. In Proverbs in general, um, uh, there's a uh, this, this constant theme without Pro throughout Proverbs that, uh, and really throughout the Old Testament, there's this picture that to betray God, for God's people to turn away from God and follow other gods, was akin to spiritual adultery. And God, God literally uses that language when the prophets come and when he brings um, a message of correction to his people. And so, um, so really in Proverbs, there's kind of like these two different ways to live that are presented. There's the way of God and there's the way of the world. And, and they're both represented by a woman. And there's, there's the woman wisdom. And she, she is at the high point of the temple and she calls out. She says, those who are simple, come here and gain knowledge. But there's also the woman folly. 
And she's also on a high place. She's also in a place of worship. She's at a she's at a, 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 a temple, a pagan temple, or a, a, you know some other place where a sacrifice would be made. And she offers life that's a whole lot easier than God's. But just come in here, come over here instead. And so we're hearing these two voices throughout the book of Proverbs. And are we going to choose to follow God's way of wisdom, or are we going to, are we going to turn to God and follow the way of the world? And so even though this passage is very on the cover, very much about like sexual uh, sin, about adultery. This is also a picture of how temptation works when it lures us to, to follow something other than God. All right, so follow along with me here. He says, my son, keep my words and treasure up my commandments with, with you. Keep my commands and live. Keep my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. Call inside your intimate friend to keep you from the forbidden woman from the adulteress with her smooth words. Like right here in front he, he can't be any more impassioned. He's like, son, son please, I love you so much. Listen. I know you go to school and I, because I did it. I know you, you know how to sit there and hear something and it comes in one ear and it just goes on that super highway and it goes out the ear. Right? It's shoot, it shoots right through. Right? He's begging us not to do that right now. He's saying, no, no, and don't just do that. He's saying, don't just take notes. He's like, like, tattoo this on yourself. Put this someplace where it could never go away. He says, write it on the tablet of your heart. He says, you've got to get a hold of this. Because life and death are hanging in the balance. So he says, he tells us a story about this, this foolish young man. So at the window of my house, I looked out through my lattice, and I have seen among the simple, and by the way, the word simple, you know, I mean, and Karen and I did, we watched some of that uncluttering, what's it called, tidying up? Tidy. We watched some tidying up. That was all right. <laughs> okay. But I know there's like a, you know, to live a simpler life. We all want things to be more simple. That is not what this is about. Like in, in Proverbs, to be simple is the opposite of being wise. To be simple is to be a foolish person. And so, he says, I have seen among the simple, I have perceived, perceived among the youths a young man lacking sense, passing along the street near her corner, taking the road to her house in the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. Now, right off the bat, we see this man, this young man, who lacks wisdom. And that's often, right, the kind of the, the association of young people is to be foolish and to have white hair is a sign of wisdom and hopefully you've learned something over the years of your life. And so, uh, but this man, the, I don't think you can, let me start that sentence over. You don't have to be a foolish young person. And that's what this guy is saying to his son. He's saying, please, even though you're, you're young, you can live wise. Okay, you, can, you can get a hold of this. You can be rescued. And so right off the bat, Here's the deal. Like, like I'll probably I'll come back to some of these things right at the end. But, but right at the back, okay? Because now nah, I'm gonna read the whole story. That doesn't make any sense. Okay, let me read the whole story and I'll come back to it. All right, so let's keep going. All right, okay, I'll start over. I saw that the simple young man. He lacked sense. He's passing along the street near her corner. Who's her corner? The adulteress. All right. He's taking the road to her house in the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. And behold, the woman meets him, dressed as a prostitute, wildly apart. She is loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Now in the street, now in the market, and in every corner she lies in wait. She seizes him and kisses him. With bold face, she says to him, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I have paid my vows. So now I have come out to meet you, to seek you eagerly, and I have found you. I have spread my couch with coverings, colored linens from Egyptian linen. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love till morning. Let us delight ourselves with love. For my husband is not home. He has gone on a long journey. He took a bag of money with him. At full moon, he will come home. With much seductive speech, she persuades him. With her smooth talk, she compels him. All at once, he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter. 
Or as a stag is caught fast till an arrow pierces its liver. As a bird rushes into a, sna a snare, he does not know that it will cost him his life. And now, O oh sons, listen to me and be attentive to the words of my mouth. Let not your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray to her paths. For many a victim has she laid low. All her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is the way to Sheol, going down to the chambers of death. So, there's definitely a time when I wrote, read this story, and if, if I were to ask you, like, when did, it, when did it really go wrong? Like, when, when did he mess up? And, uh, and I probably, at one point in my life, I would have said, well, probably in verse 22. Right? In verse 22, uh, all at once, he follows her. Right? And, and one of the things that's very clear from this passage is all she can do, all temptation can do, is seduce, suggest, invite. But at the end of the day, he made a choice. And that's how temptation works. James 1 says that each one of us is, uh, hang on, when we're tempted, I guess I started being, when we're tempted, do not say God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. And so we don't get to blame God, we don't even get to blame the devil, because at the end of the day, we're responsible, even this man, he followed her. And so I'd say, yeah, I'm probably there in verse 22. That's probably where it all went wrong. And tonight, I'm going to suggest to you that all went wrong in verse 8. In verse 8, it says, I saw a young man passing along the street near her corner. And guys, in our lives, like, like this is usually what happens. We, we think, oh man, you know, I, I, shouldn't have, uh, I shouldn't have done that. Whatever that thing is, uh, there's that sin again that keeps kicking my tail. But that wasn't the moment. It was way back here when I first started thinking about it. When I first started considering it, when I was like, oh, you know. And so this man, he's just like, I'm just going to go for a walk. Nothing wrong with going for a walk after all, right? You know, I mean, I, I, I'm at my house. What am I going to go left or right? I mean, like, 50-50. So I'm going to head right. What difference does it make? And he already knows what's down that side of town. But he starts walking that way. And guys, that's when you lose. Now there are off ramps. You could still say no. And God does that. And, and I hope that you've at least experienced the whisper of the Spirit, even in your failures, and you know, and you can look back and be like, man, God gave me an off-ramp there, and God gave me an off-ramp there. But here's the thing. You know, even if, if we were to, um, I don't know, when we're driving in Florida, you know, it, it's not that hard to stop when you're right here, you're just starting to get out of the BSU and there's ice in the parking lot. But you know what, when you're going down I-70, and you're going to however fast you go down I-70, there's lots of off-ramps, but you're going so fast, they're really hard to take. And that's how temptation works. Is Yeah, he could have stopped, but in a sense, it's like it's kind of too late. He couldn't stop. And, and, and I don't know if you've ever, um, I don't know, I'm not trying to, to like, uh, I'm going to say this, I don't know. So I, 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 don't, I don't want, like, we're talking about this topic. I, I want to be real with you guys, but I'm not trying to, for some things, maybe there's some sin that you've, that's been deeply hurt by, by somebody else's sin, or by your own sin, and maybe you carry a lot of guilt, or, or just regret, or something else. I'm not trying to break open old wounds. I'm not trying to hurt anybody tonight. But, but I just know, like, if you've ever been, you know, like, dating, you've been in a physical relationship, I'm just saying, like, man, things can start going fast real quick. Right? And it's like, once things start speeding up, they usually don't stop. It just gets harder and harder to hit the brakes. Okay? I'll just go with that. I don't think, you know, I'm not trying to open any wounds. But this is how it goes. So he lost the battle in verse 8 when he headed out of his house and turned right and started going down towards her house. Okay? And so whatever the temptations are that you struggle with, I'm telling you, this is where you need to start working to win the battle. It's in step one. And that's why in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, Paul says, we take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. And this is really where the battles go. And it's even as simple as, like, like what I said, even just changing the way that I think about the other people on the road. Man, that changed everything. And so, 
So that first step is crucial. But, but then you see, right, he's going out, and he goes out at nighttime. She, I mean, there's way more, right? Oh, there's a reason that, you know, mom says don't be out past midnight. Because nothing good happens. This is it's like, what do you think is going to happen? And this guy is putting himself in a dangerous place. And so, what do you know? What do you know? He, he, he starts to wander out of his door, and what does he find? Temptation. It's right there. It's waiting. And, and like, you know, she does not stay at home. In the street, in the market, at every corner, she lies in wait. And man, that's one of those things. Like, you don't have to go look for temptation. Temptation's going to come looking for you. And if you're not ready, it's going to eat you for lunch. And so we see this. And so this is the pattern, guys. And it doesn't really matter what the temptation is. Like I said, it, it, it's, it's what's common to man. And this is how it plays out. And, and I know because we're all sinners. So I'm guessing we all recognize this pattern when we experience this in our own lives. You know, I, I, yeah, you know what? I started heading down that way, and it's the same old thing. And I started picking up some speed. And there it was. I was like, whoa, nope. Temptation came out to meet me. And this is what she says. She seizes him. And she kisses him. She grabs a hold of him. And she says some things to him. You guys, this is how temptation works. All right, last week, right, we read about the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes of our life, and how all three of those were wrapped up in the garden when Adam and Eve took the fruit and ate it. Satan didn't tell them, you're going to curse the whole human race. Like, the whole, the whole world is going to become sinners because of you. I can't tell them that. No, no, no. This is how it comes, and it says things like this. Uh, it says... Uh, well, first of all, it grabs our attention. It pretends to be harmless, even innocent. Listen to what she says. She says, you know, I had to offer sacrifices, and today I paid my vows. What she's saying is, she says, I'm right with God. Like, this is innocent. This is harmless. She says, this is going to be enjoyable. It's going to be fun, right? Man, temptation came, and, and it looked like, uh, man, I know some people don't like visual, like, gross things, so I'm not, oh man, I got all these things that I want to say, but just, just, if it looked like something gross and whatever pops in your head, like, that's not how temptation looks, right? It looks beautiful, it looks attractive, it looks appealing, it looks fun, and so she says, you know, hey, look, I, 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 I've come to meet you, I'm excited about you, we feel special, we, we, we're personalized, and, and I've spread my couch with coverings, with these fine linens, and these perfumes, and these aloes, it's like, this is going to be great. And that's what temptation says to us. Come, come. This is going to be so much fun. It's going to be so enjoyable. And temptation says, there's going to be no consequences. It says, come. My husband's not at home. He's gone. He took a bag full of money. Like, he's going to be gone for a long time. And so it's just come, and, and he's not going to be here for a long time. So let's just delight ourselves. And so temptation, it offers us joy, it offers us fulfillment, uh, it, it offers us no consequences, and it's a lie. And, and, and really, guys, we know that because we've experienced it, because the, the story completely changes, because on the one hand, temptation offers us all that, and so we take it, and then, then it changes, and, and the voices that we experience say things like, Instead of it saying, nobody will know, now we hear this voice, everybody's going to find out. Everybody's going to know what you did. Everybody's going to judge you. you how, how could you call yourself a Christian? How could you claim to love God and do this? You're terrible. You're nobody. You're horrible. And it turns to a voice of condemnation. And it leads to death. And this is the predictable result of temptation. And so, uh, so first of all, I know, right, this is fun. Having a good time. But man, is this, this is so real, guys. This is life. Like, we live this consistently. But, but can I go back to what I said at the beginning? Like, God is faithful. Jesus understands. He wants to help you. There is victory to be had. And so we don't have to live in defeat. And so there are tools and, and weapons that God has given to us to win the battle. All right? And so, so I'm going to give you guys tonight, I'm going to give you... Um, I'll, I'll go through this pretty quickly, but I have six things. I mean, these are just kind of a winning strategy against temptation in your life. Okay, so first of all, is you just got to own it and realize, don't you dare think that it couldn't happen to you. And it, it's, there are several American pastimes 
I know one of them is to judge people. Right? It's to sit back and throw rocks. And if, if anybody ever screws up, boy, we're ready to tear them down. But we probably should just be thankful that we haven't had the opportunity to sin quite like some people. You know, I could sit back and, and pick out some famous athletes or actors or politicians or people who fall into sexual sin, and I could really, you know, put them on blast. But I know this is going to shock you. But I've never had women throwing themselves at me. All right? <laughs> I don't know what that's like, and I sure couldn't promise that I would just be virtuous all the time, especially as a single man. All right? I'm sorry, I have one more. I, I don't know what to do. It's all right, you're all mine. Yes, absolutely. That's, I, I want it that way. Um, but, but there are some, I've heard to say this way that there are some temptations that are above us. All right? And that's for, I'm thankful that I've never had the opportunity to sin in the ways that some people have. Right, but it's sure easy to throw rocks at, at famous people, rich people, powerful people. Uh, but don't ever think that it couldn't happen to you. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 12 says, um, Take heed, lest you fall. The pride goes before a fall. And one of the worst things that we can do is think, Ah, that couldn't happen to me. I could never do that, man. But by the grace of God, that was you. That would be you. So, so first of all, just first and foremost, as we are one step away from a series of steps that can ruin our lives. It's that the roller coaster starts picking up speed and now you can't get off. It's going too fast. So, so that's more of a way of just like a self. And this is just, again, as we change the way we think, we, we begin to think about things the way God does. Because, because temptation is not, sin's not inevitable. Like I don't have to give in to that. God will provide a way out, but I have to take it. So, uh, so one of the things, I, I think probably aside from that, I think the, the first thing that I get from this passage is that we have to, we have to practice what I want to call first frame thinking. And there's this comic strip that, I know last week I mentioned Saturday morning cartoons and you guys are not there. Okay, that's not, that's not a thing. Now, that's something else that used to be a thing was to get the Sunday morning paper and all the comics were in color. Okay, some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Okay, okay. So there was a comic called Kathy. And Kathy was like maybe a 40-something woman, and, and she struggles with love, and she struggles with her relationship with her mom, and she struggles with dieting, okay? And she says, ack, a lot, ack, A-C-K. That's like her signature phrase. How many of you guys know who Kathy is? Okay, like four of you. Uh, okay, a couple of you guys know that one I've been that's fine. All right, I appreciate you. I have searched, I read about this in a book, and I have searched for this comic. I can't believe it. You guys ever go looking for something on the internet and you don't find it? You're just like, no. Yeah. <laughs> no. I can't find it. I was so bad that I just want to put this comic strip up here for you guys, but I can't find it. And so, maybe some of you guys are better at that than I am. Maybe you can find this. So I'm going to tell you about this 10-frame this, um, um, Kathy comic. All right, you just kind of imagine the pictures as you go as I go but um, you know she's struggling with a diet and so in the first frame she says to herself she's like I'm gonna go for a drive but I'm not gonna go near the grocery store right and then the second frame she's like well I'll I'll, you know, I'll go by the grocery store but I'm not gonna go in uh, the day, then the third frame she says well I mean I'll, I'll, I'll go into the grocery store but but I will not walk down the aisle where the candy is on sale so then she's in the, the candy aisle. She's like, well, I mean, I'll look at the candy, but I'm not going to pick it up. And uh, she's like, well, I mean, I can pick it up, but I'm not going to, I'm going to buy it. I'm not going to buy it, right? So then, of course, she's like, I'll, I'll buy it, but I won't open it. You know, I'll open it, but I won't smell it. I'll smell it, but I won't taste it. I'll taste it, but I won't eat it. And the last frame, of course, it's just eat, eat, eat. You know, it's just stuff in her face. Candy's flying, wrapping, just going everywhere. It's, it's chaos. Right? And again, where did she lose the battle? It was in the very first frame when she said, well, I'll go for a drive, but I'm not going to go to the grocery store. And I just want to encourage you guys to, to really, man, that's just something we can spend so much time on, and, and, and you can talk to one another about it. Really, in your life, things, especially things that you struggle with on a consistent basis, coming back to that very first frame, taking every thought captive, because I think we know deep down 
But I'm like, well, I'll go for a drive, but I won't go to the grocery store. We already know. We know how this is going to end up. And that's where the battle needs to be won. All right. Third thing. Memorizing God's word. Psalm 119, says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. you guys, there's a reason that Hebrews 4, 4.12 says the word of God is living and active. Because God's word is powerful. God's word is really is the sword of the spirit. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't get into a back and forth with Satan and go and say, well, you know, that's probably not the best idea. You know, if I do this, then I'm probably going to end up over here. He just says it is written. It is written. Man should not live by bread alone. It is written. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And I'm telling you, there is power in God's word. And it doesn't matter what you struggle with. There is scripture that can help you. I don't have time to listen to them all. But man, if you need some specific things, you want some help with some verses that would help you out, I would love to share those things with you. All right, give me some verses. All right, three more. Uh, man, stay out of the wrong neighborhood. What do I mean by that? Well, again, this guy, he wandered into the neighborhood where, where, the, where that, that adulterous woman, that prostitute, where she was. And so this is, I think, a, a really... When I'm talking to people, I like to try to, to I think it's a fun thing to talk about because it's so applicable, it's so helpful. But really start to understand, because there are patterns to sin in our lives, especially things that continually kick your tail. Alright, and so there's places that will continue to go. And so, uh, so, so first of all, I was going to tell you guys, there are, uh, in general, there, the, sometimes it's called halt, H-A-L-T, i give you this. The times when we're often more susceptible to temptation, when we're hungry, when we're angry, when we're lonely, and when we're tired. And that's not the only time we face temptation, but that's often when we're more susceptible. And so recognizing that, man, if I'm, if I'm tired, maybe I need to not be there. If I'm angry, maybe I, I mean, make sure that I'm not in that situation, that environment. And so, uh, so there may be specific situations you need to avoid. There may be specific people that you need to avoid. Um, Proverbs says, do not become friends with a hot-tempered man, you will learn his ways. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says, do not be deceived. You need to see bad company corrupts good character. And so, so sometimes staying out of that neighborhood means there's people that you just can't be around. Stay out of the wrong neighborhood. Kind of correlated to that, as, I'm having, as I want to have victory over temptation in my life, is like, be where you're supposed to be. And one of the Probably, I mean, like one of the worst sin stories in the Bible is in 2 Samuel 11, because it's the story of David and Bathsheba. David, who's a man after God's own heart. David, who is God's chosen king. And the whole story, this is exactly how it goes down. The very first verse of 2 Samuel 11, this is what it says. In fact, David, what's David famous for? A couple of things. Killing Goliath, right? There was, I don't know, this is maybe a little less, less commonly known, but there was a song that they sang that King, that King Saul hated. Does anybody know what the song was? The song was, Saul has slain his thousands, and David, tens of thousands. David wanted to build, David loved God, and David wanted to build a temple for God. And you know why God said, no, you can't build a temple? I know not, this isn't like uh, Bible trivia night, but but if you do know, does anybody know why God, what God said to David, you can't build a temple for Why? Because you're a man of war. He says, your son will be a man of peace. He will build a temple for me. And so David made as many preparations for the temple as he could. And Solomon was the one to build it. Now most guys, like if you went around your name tag, like if God were like, and I said, Jonathan, man of war. We're like, yeah. All right. So, I mean, David is a man's man. He's a man of war. He's a valiant fighter. He's done all these great things to help deliver God's people. He's trusted God. He trusted God when he was a young man fighting the giant. So listen to this. 2 Samuel 11.1. 1. It says, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men, the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites, they besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. He already lost the battle. David is a man of war, and it's time. It's like, you know, the game has started. This is kickoff. This is the time when we all go to war. 
So let's go, king of war. And David's like, no, you guys go ahead. Go on. You got this one. I'm just going to stay home. Why did he stay home? Why did Captain start driving towards the grocery store? Why did the young man wander down the street towards your neighborhood? Because he'd already lost the battle. This is where it happens. And guys, I know this is not the Bible, and this is just a cliche, the idle hands do the devil's work. But I tell you what, when you're not doing what you ought to be doing, you are really susceptible to temptation. And so be busy being proactive, doing what God has called you to do. That's why in Galatians 5, Paul says, walk by the Spirit, and you won't gratify the desires of simple nature. If you're pursuing what God has for you to do, you won't have time. It just gets so much easier, guys. And I know that that's true. I've experienced that. I'm sure you've experienced that. The last thing that I have here for you guys is to have some genuine accountability in your life. If you think you can do this by yourself, you're a fool. I mean, David, the man for God's own heart, he was all by himself. And it all went down. It all went wrong. Ecclesiastes 4, 9, 10 says, Two are better than one, because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. That we all stumble in many ways. And as long as we think it can't happen to us, or it won't happen to us, or I don't need anybody else's help, we're not going to win. We're not going to have victory. And, uh, and I think that's part of why it says in uh, James 5, 16, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you can be healed. There's just so much power, guys. Um, I've shared this before. I, I was in college, even before college, like I was uh, hopelessly addicted to pornography. And I know for a fact when God really began to work victory in my life is when I stopped hiding and I stopped keeping that to myself and I opened up with some brothers. And it was scary, and it was miraculous. And I've seen it over and over and over, that, that God works as we're real with each other, as we share with one another. And I'm not saying you need to come up here on Thursday night and ask me during some 95 minutes to, to tell everybody all my deepest, darkest sins. I'm going to be like, no, you don't. <laughs> no, we're not doing that. Just find one or two people that you can trust. Even even a lot of brothers, if you're I think if you're a woman, you need to find a sister. If you're a man, you need to find a brother. Right? But find someone that you can walk with. Because man, I just time and time. I don't I mean, I don't know if there is a uh, you know, you see pastors who fall or prominent Christians. I don't know. I just wonder, were any of them really in close community with other people, being real, having genuine fellowship accountability. I mean, I just think they probably weren't. Maybe they worked for a little bit, maybe they were just kind of, you know, you know how it is. You can share a little bit, but not everything. Can't go it alone. And so as, I, as I'm going to close here, I don't have any more slides. I didn't put this on a slide, but guys, I just want you to know. Uh, because I know, like I said earlier, I think this topic can be very painful. If, if there's something that you're struggling with, if there's a sin that you're trapped in, or you're just dealing with guilt and shame. Um, but you got to take it to the cross. First, first John 1 9 says that if, uh, that, that if, we're, uh, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to cleanse us, uh, uh, forgives our sins and cleanses us of all unrighteousness. Uh, Romans 8 1 says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Uh, Colossians 2 13 it says that He forgave us our sins, He forgave us all our sins. That he canceled the written code that was against the sin of Moses. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. That Jesus didn't just die from your guilt, but Jesus died hanging naked on the cross. The most shameful death that he could die. He died for your shame. And so I'm not here tonight to beat you up. I'm here to tell you that he understands, that he offers you forgiveness, that he offers you grace, that he offers you victory. Take it to the cross. He says in 1 John 2, 1, he says, My dear children, I write, I write this to you so you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous one, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And so, it's, it's much more important to plan for how we're going to have spiritual victory in our lives than how we're going to capitalize on the Super Bowl. But as I said before, I'll end with this. So many people have said, I would give anything to undo what was done. Are we willing to do whatever it takes 
to prevent it from happening in the first place. To have victory in our lives because God is faithful, because Jesus understands, and He wants to give us victory. And so, so I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up, and we're going to close in the song. And it's just an opportunity for you to do business with God, for you to respond to whatever He's laid on your heart. Uh, just depend. As the author of Hebrews says, and if you hear His voice, do not harden your hearts. Uh, respond to him. I mean, if you want to talk later, if you want to pray, I'd be happy to. Maybe you seem to grab somebody next to you. Maybe you can pray for somebody else. But, uh, but let's let's just respond to him. So.